the premise of this presentation is that the model of urbanization that was developed in the Industrial Revolution has now locked us into a lifestyle in cities around the world which actually is completely unsustainable, both because we're locked into using fossil fuels which are uh, polluting the planet and also are running out, but also the fact that the resources we need to live in cities like this is much higher than the resources we have available. So basically this model is dead. There is nothing to learn from the Western development in cities and what we're now, I'm now going to present is a, is a re-envisaging of a new direction uh, for urban development uh, into the future. And this re-envisaging has to recognize not only the fact that we're polluting the planet and destroying the ecosystem that supports our lives and the lives of natural systems on the planet, but also due to population growth in the last 100 years, we've gone from having around an average of eight hectares of land to support our life on the planet each to only having around two hectares of land. And by the time we get to 2050 with the population growth, we'll only have about one and a half hectares of land. And patently, not in India, but in most other countries, developed countries particularly, we're living way beyond the means of the planet. And because we're also polluting the air, the soil and the water, we're destroying the ecosystem as we go. Now, India currently consumes about 0.9 hectares of land per person in terms of the average across India. China, around 2 hectares per person. So both India and China are still at or below the current global earth share. Essentially, I've got to talk about economics because we use GDP as the measure and driver of success. And the measure of GDP is a measure of resource consumption, non-renewable resource consumption, uh, not valuing the natural environment. So we're destroying the ecosystem while we think we're making success by driving GDP. Because if you use renewable resources efficiently, you don't have inflation. The whole idea of inflation comes from using non-renewable resources which start to run out and the prices go up, but that doesn't happen if you've got renewable resources. So it's, a, it's an economic model which I believe is very attractive for India. So the definition for 2050 globally that I have used in this analysis is first of all an average reduction of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas emissions across the world of 50% which of course was agreed by the G8 ministers and has now actually been agreed by everybody at the Copenhagen Climate Summit because it is the two degree target figure that was actually pretty much signed up to by everyone. But of course there isn't agreement yet on how that's going to be divvied up between the countries. I'll come back to that in a minute. The second component is, is to get to an ecological footprint of around one and a half hectares per person uh, in each country which of course is very challenging if you're in North America, but maybe not so challenging. Arrow refers to it as tunneling through to a position that India can get to. I believe it's possible and I'll explain how. And at the same time, allowing human development index to increase. Now the really good news about this is that this model is so powerful that the amount of money you're gonna have available for human development increase by following this economic model is going to be very large indeed because you're not gonna be spending all the money on all that wasteful infrastructure you didn't really need in the first place. Now in terms of ecological economics theory, there are three levels of policy at national government level that you have to follow. One is you have to value natural capital, the thing we're destroying, we have to value it in terms of making policy decisions. And the first way the world is doing that is by setting a high carbon price. And if there's any value coming out of the Copenhagen summit, it is that everyone's now agreed that a high carbon price is really important, particularly business. So that's the first way we start to value natural capital, but there are other ways too. The second one is something we care very deeply about, which is we have to have a fair distribution of these resources. These, these efficient renewable resources have to be distributed fairly so this isn't just something for rich people. And then the final level is, is actually driving policies which actually uh, drive an efficient use of renewable energy uh, and other resources and water. And what goes with that, of course, is the climate change action plan that India has put out there, which is, is saying we're gonna have a lot of renewable energies, we're gonna, we're gonna worry about uh, adaptation to, to reduction of water flows in the rivers, we're gonna worry about agriculture, we're gonna worry particularly about 
water resources. We're going to make India a lot greener and make people aware of all the issues, which all fits with what I'm going to tell you. But of course, that has to be translated into action on the ground. And as I said earlier, it has to be related to land use planning. And this is a theme of this presentation. India will not be able to have that energy intensity target, will not be able to reduce its or keep its emissions at a low level unless land use planning is really activated in a much stronger way at national, uh, regional and local level. This is the sort of graph for the long term that we have to understand we've got to follow if we're going to survive at all on the planet. Uh, and basically India may be allowed to increase its emissions a little bit but up to 2030, but India will have to follow every other country in the world and then reduce emissions back below that level by 2100. Because we're all on a path to having almost no carbon emissions by 2100 if we're actually going to survive on the planet. Resource efficiency for me is not just about energy and so many people are focused on energy and climate change when actually we should be focused on energy, food, um, raw materials and water. And the next really big problem, which you are, I think, increasingly acutely aware of, is that globally we're now producing less food every week per person than we did the week before. And this is because the miracle of chemical, agri uh, chemical uh, fertilizer agriculture is now falling away. We can no longer increase using that. The other major issue that, of course, you're, you're facing is the fact that uh, 50 to 60 percent of people living in cities now live in informal <laughs> settlements. So any sustainable solution has to address the issue of taking informal settlements to a, an ecological condition in which people can thrive and the economy can grow. And therefore, that is very much part of what I'm going to be talking about. And the critical element of the informal settlements, of course, is many of them are in the way of some of the impacts of climate change itself. And one of the great things that's come out of the Copenhagen summit is that uh, climate justice is now recognized globally. So in my analysis globally, I, I say basically for, for India, it's basically a transition from an agricultural economy to, to directly to the ecological age. Forget the industrial model, that didn't work. What I'm saying to you is you can make urban development part of a strategy of lifting urban and rural economy at the same time and recycle nutrients from the city as part of the fertilizer for the, for the uh, environment and you can bring food production into the city. Now we come to existing cities, um, and Delhi um, has an ecological footprint of around two hectares per person, so uh, obviously above the average for India, and that it means taking Delhi to a, to, a, to a footprint of around one and a half uh, hectares per person. So it's not a massive shift, but obviously there's a lifestyle change that happens in here, uh, which I, I'm going to touch on.